Good morning. Good morning. We need the moisture. I like the pitter pat of rain on the roof. I don't like getting up in it. <laughs> um, we have uh, Kevin and Imelda are back from Mexico. They had a good trip. I'm going to invite Kevin up uh, to come and share with us all that happened with them. Well, you don't have to discuss all, but the high points of what happened with them. So, Kevin, if you are ready. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we were very, very, very blessed by this trip. It was way too short. We were only eight days. Um, but in that eight days, God really, really just showed us so many things that blessed us and confirmed what we believe is His will for us to go down and serve in Mexico. Um, we, oh, where to start? Um, basically, the first blessing, I guess, was just the, the children's connection with their grandmother down there. She didn't speak any English, and they don't really speak any Spanish yet, or they didn't when we first got there. But, <laughs> um, anyway, she, uh, she just, they just loved on her, and just it was a really, really blessing to see that relationship grow. And, um, then also just going to the orphanage and just being there and seeing the kids, um, I was a little kind of concerned how, well, I shouldn't have been worried. Mila's really out there and uh, rambunctious and loves kids, so loves everybody, um, but she just played with the kids like they all spoke the same language, and then in about three days, she almost did speak the language, and she was, <laughs> she was just jabbering in Spanish to these kids, and I was just like, where did you learn that? And every now and then, she'd come to me and ask me, you know, well, how do you say this in Spanish, you know? Um, then the little kids were coming to me and say, how do you say this in English, you know? And it was, it was really awesome. It was just a blessing to see that, how it just was. In fact, um, kind of broke my heart. We were there probably the fifth day or sixth day or so we were visiting with the, the house parents of the boys' dorm. And uh, Mila was running around playing with all the boys and then she was sitting on that lap of the, the lady that, um, with, that takes care of the boys. And, and I said, wow, Mila, you're really friendly with her, you know? I said, maybe you should, maybe you should stay here with her. She was like, okay. <laughs> I said, well, I said, Mila, don't you understand? We're, we're leaving and we're going to be gone for quite a while, a long time, you know? And she goes, I'll pray for you every night. <laughs> uh, so, so the family fitting in and, and being down there was really, it, it went really well. We were really blessed. Um, so then the other thing, the other part of the trip that we were trying to accomplish was um, meeting with the, these three different groups of missionaries, the, the directors of the orphanage, which they actually came down to Puerto Vallarta, it's a two and a half hour drive one way, um, to come down and pick us up at the airport, um, and then they brought us up and then actually took us back down again when we left, which was really a blessing because it gave us hours, I could do the math, but whatever, um, uh, to, to spend, spend just getting to, to reconnect with them and, and talk to them about the ministry and about their heart and about where we are, and, and it was just, constantly confirmation from God that, that they really wanted us there and they felt that God wanted us there and vice versa. So that was really neat. Uh, we met the other head of ministry. Um, they do the uh, fish and mission adventure, I think I mentioned before. Um, up on the, there's a reservoir about an hour from Topeak. Um, they've been building that up. They're in their eighth year, I think, of building that place and they're building you know, just a, a facility to house people so they can come and stay do fishing, you know, because it's actually a renowned bass fishing destination, or it's becoming one, uh, for anybody that knows anything about bass fishing. Um, there's quite a bit of bass fishing that goes on in Mexico, but um, anyway, so what they're doing is, is building a place that, that people can come and do that, the bass fishing thing, and pay, pay to be there, and then all the proceeds of that will go directly to the orphanage, you know, anything about cost, so it's just a really a neat, neat couple that do that. Um, they're praying for someone to take over as they're starting to get older and wanting to pass on their vision. So I'm, I, I think they were hoping that we might be the ones or something, you know. That. <laughs> and so um, I have no idea on that. So, but, um, so we had a really good time with them. We went also and met with 
some other missionaries that have been down there for, I think, 17 years now, um, living in Topeka. Um, they have a ministry with the Indians up in the mountains, um, and they also do stuff in their church, they do stuff in their community, they do stuff at the orphanage. I mean, they're just go, 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 go all the time. Um, and they're also, one of the blessings about meeting with them um, and visiting with them, we actually had dinner at Burger King, which was, you know, I don't go to Mexico to eat Burger King, but whatever. <laughs> they, they wanted to eat there, so. Um, but we, we visited with them, and they were really, really encouraging on raising support because um, they've done it for many years and they've done it very successfully. Um, God has blessed them and showed them and a lot of ways to do it. And So they gave us a lot of advice and encouragement in that area, so we're kind of ready to hit the ground running again here this week and start, start doing that. Um, so all in all, it was really, really, really a blessed trip. We just, the, the kids did really good on the plane. Um, I, the longest ride was about four hours and 45 minutes, um, but they did really good. Um, the one other thing I just wanted to ask you guys is prayer for uh, my family, prayer for Imelda. She's not feeling well, um, which isn't surprising because that's what usually happens in the first few months of her pregnancy. Oh. So, <laughs> anyway, just continue prayers on our preparation and getting ready and the house selling and all that stuff. We appreciate it very much. Kevin, uh, Imelda's mom is doing much better physically, correct? Yes. Okay. She is. She's still feeling the effects of you know, being, having a stroke and getting kind of paralyzed on the one side, but she's getting a lot stronger and better. Thanks. That's just another testimony to the efficacy of prayer, because um, when, when she first had her stroke, um, that went right through our prayer line. And um, did God respond to our prayers? Absolutely. Was he responding to other people's prayers? Absolutely. But ultimately, we know that God's heart towards his people is good. So we thank God for many, many answered prayers. All right. Galatians chapter 5. Flip open there. This is going to be our last stop here for a while. going to wrap up Galatians. And I started putting notes together and pulling things from here and there and, and had these wonderful ideas. And as I was reading over my stuff this morning, I'm not sure that's what God wants me to talk about. So I'm going to wing this. So my, my pages of notes here may or may not even get used. Picking up, we're going to start reading verse 16. So Galatians 5, verse 16, Paul is writing and he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, and he gives us a list, an exemplary list, not a, a, a comprehensive list. Down in verse 22, we're going to jump down, verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Would you go ahead and put the uh, definitions up there for me? 
Now, this is probably overly simplistic, but these are working definitions that I put together so we could kind of have an understanding when we're talking about each of these um, fruits that we'd all be kind of working from the same place. So love. This is agape love. This is the love that God has for us that we can't even comprehend until we receive it. This is the love that he's asking us to give. Okay? Now, you can't give something you don't have. Okay? You can't give something you have not received. Now, agape love is completely unconditional, even unmerited on the part of the receiver. It's based completely on the giver. <clears throat> Choosing to love, regardless of what the receiver has or has not done. Okay, this is how God loves us. Scripture tells us that, that God loved us so much that even while we were sinners, even while we were his enemies, directly opposed to him, he made a way for us to be restored in relationship to him. Okay? Now this, this unconditional love is such that it gives the receiver what they need, not necessarily what they want. Okay? And for example, you know, the first Bible verse most people learn is John 3.16. For God so loved the world, for God so agape the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, whoever believed would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Okay? That love required of God to give what we needed, not necessarily what we wanted. Okay? Because in our carnal mind, we have no clue what we need. But we want a lot of things that have nothing to do with God. Okay? And that's really the whole point of this passage of Scripture. Because, see, there's an eternal war going on. Up until God completes the work in us, there's a war that will never cease between your flesh and His Spirit. Now, when you come to Christ, you come bringing nothing. You have nothing to offer him. Nothing of value that he would go, okay, that's a fair trade. You come to him understanding that you desperately need him. He does not need you. He wants you. He longs for you. He longs to have intimate relationship with you. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. I actually, I want you to say this. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your head. Say it low in a voice. But God wants me. Not because of anything I've done. But because that's his heart and his nature. Okay. This is the same love that His Spirit birthed in us for others. As a matter of fact, you know the Scripture, uh, Jesus says, don't hate your enemies, but love them. It's the same word. Okay. We, we love our enemies with an agape love. Now that agape love is not Phileo, it's not the friend love, it's not the pal around love, it's not the kind of love that you have with, with your close friends. You don't associate with their sin. You don't embrace their lifestyle. But you love them unconditionally. You love them enough to say, hey look, God wants you and your life has separated you from him. And the only way to have restoration with relationship with God is the cross. We don't cuddle up their sin. Oh, that's okay. 
God's not offended. He is offended. Grievously offended. Look at the cost that it took to pay the price for that sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And Hebrews is such an incredible writing because we see in the Old Testament the establishment of the law. Hey, man, you commit this sin, this is what's required of you. It's no wonder they were an agricultural-based society. They had to have lots of animals. <laughs> Bulls, rams, ewes, he goats and she goats, nannies and billies. Birds. And every year they had to go and sacrifice for their sins. But it wasn't just a once a year thing. Because if you became aware of a sin, man, the only way to be redeemed from that sin, to, be, to, to receive forgiveness for that sin, was sacrifice. But Jesus, being the perfect sacrifice, has paid once and for all. All sin. Every sin from Adam to the last one before final judgment. Every sin in your life, known and unknown, past, present, future, has been paid for at the cross. That's the love that God has for us. Being absolutely perfect in His justice. You know, we look at a lot of things and we go, oh, we like to classify our sins. And the ones that are really personal to us are not quite as bad as the one that you have. Yeah, I, I, I know I struggle with this, but did you see that guy? Look at him. Deflect, deflect. Put your shield up, keep that happy Christian face on, and when those things come at you, deflect it to somebody else so nobody sees the real you. But God sees the real you. God sees every one of your sins, not just what you do, but what you think. And it's all covered in the blood. So, agape love. What, what does that mean? We, we love our enemies. Okay. How, how about forgiveness? But see, when, when he went to the cross, he set the measure by which we are to forgive. You, you, do you see that? He forgive everything. Everything. So, who are we to withhold forgiveness from somebody in our lives? You, you don't know how they hurt me. Yeah, some of you I know, you've been grievously hurt. And you bear deep wounds. But they sinned against God first. Remember David and Bathsheba? And David writes a psalm after this whole thing is over. And he says... Against you, Father, against you, God, and you only have I sinned. I, I can't even <clears throat> understand that because Uriah is dead. God received the offense first. By the measure you forgive, you will be forgiven. Now, that's not a salvation Thing. I think it's a measure of how you're trapped in your life. If you're holding on to unforgiveness, I don't think you can really receive the forgiveness from God that you need. Love, absolutely unconditional, not based on what they are, not based on whether or not they are worthy. Okay? It's based on what you've received. You've received that absolute unconditional love from God. It should fill you up and pour out from you. <clears throat> joy. I, I, I struggle with joy. I, I tend to be more of a... Christy, Christy says I'm a pessimist. I say I'm a realist. Okay, You know the difference between a pessimist and an optimist? You know, an optimist sees the glass half full and a pessimist sees it half empty. I see it's not Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't care if it's half full or half empty. It's not what I wanted. Okay? So 
joy I, I tend to struggle with. But Scripture tells me that in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. Okay, so if I don't have joy, why is it? Well, it's not because of him. It's because of me. Where am I spending my time? I think a lot. I wish sometimes I could stop. Christy will often ask me as we drive. She'll say, what are you thinking? <laughs> I'll list off three or four things. And she's like, there's no way you could be thinking that many things. I just asked you... 35 seconds ago when you weren't thinking those things. I don't know. One thing trips over another. But the tendency that I have is to look at things in a potentially negative light. I want to be prepared for the worst. No, that's not what Scripture tells me. Scripture tells me that these three things abide. Faith, hope, and love. And if I'm in his presence and I'm really earnestly, honestly believing that he is taking care of me, what do I have to worry about? Nothing. He's got it. He's got it. You get the opportunity. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. I've been reading, I've been listening to uh, some podcasts from Voice of the Martyrs and listening to brothers and sisters overseas in places like China and India and Iran and the things that they're facing where when they gather together it's in secret and it's, it's with the, the constant awareness that at any moment the secret police will break down the door and do horrific <coughs> things to you. <clears throat> horrific things. See, they don't want to just silence you they want to punish you. And James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Consider it joy. See, our, our thinking is skewed. Our thinking is not right because we're not looking at the one that takes care of us. We're looking at everything that's going on around us. See, that's where people confuse happiness with joy. Happiness is based on the happenings, things that are going on around you. If things are going well, I can be happy. But if things are not going well, I won't be happy. But joy should be there regardless of what's going on around you. You know in an intimate way the Almighty God. You have relationship with the one who by his very word, everything is held together. Who has proclaimed his love for you and that his plans for you are good, who tells you that what you're suffering right now is light and momentary, and is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory waiting for us. Joy. Get in his presence. Put aside all the garbage that clutters your mind and befouls your soul, and get into the presence of God and find joy. Peace. We have access to peace that the world cannot give. Jesus tells us in John 14, I am giving you my peace. It's not a peace like anything the world has. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, if you're worried about things, if things are getting you down, if you're struggling, take those things to the Father. Bring your prayers and petitions with thanksgiving. Count your blessings. Write them down. Make a list. Put it in front of your face where you will see it. And when you're struggling, when, when you're starting to get anxious about things, start looking at those blessings and start thanking God for them. And then come before Him and say, God, I've got this issue. I don't know what to do with it. I, I need you to take care of it. <coughs> he wants every single burden in your life. Every one of them. He wants you to give them to Him. 
Not like a yo-yo. We snap it out and we snap it back. God, here it is. Could I have it back? And then, the peace of God, which is beyond understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. And I love that it says your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus, because it's what you think and what you feel. Those are guarded. God is keeping those. And you should have peace. But it takes discipline. Because see, God hasn't presented us all these things and, and said, here, they're all yours. And, and we just go, yay! Now I've got love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Yay! A lot of times we get in our own way. Because you, do you see where we started off in Galatians 5, 16? You've got to choose to let these things happen. His Spirit's in there. It's there. And He wants to build it in you. 2 Peter tells us that, that it's there. And it will be increasing as we mature, as we're sanctified, as we're going through the process of being made like Him. These things will grow in our lives. If they're not growing, why is it? Whose fault is it? Yeah, that's mine. Well, the yours isn't mine. Yours is yours. Mine is mine. You have to consciously choose sometimes every minute how you will walk. Will you walk according to His Spirit or will you walk according to your flesh? Will you continue in the same failures that has marked your life or will you step into something new and embrace what God is doing in you and start letting that fruit grow in you? Peace. Patience. <clears throat> Having the ability to avenge yourself but refraining from doing so. <clears throat> Good example of that. Did any of us deserve life? No. Before God, what did we deserve? Yeah. Death. God is absolutely perfect in His judgment. And in his judgment, we were all worthy of death. And yet he has held back his wrath. Why? So that all who would would come in. <clears throat> We've got to think about that sometimes when we're praying. God, come back quickly. <clears throat> Do you really want God to answer your prayer knowing that there might be some who don't get in because you wanted him to come back sooner than he did? Think about that. Think about your loved ones that don't know Him. When you grow impatient and you want things done now and you want God to return and take us to glory, think about who's not going to be there. And thank God that He knows better than you. That He is patient. Now, how does that play out in your life? Being impatient. Having the ability to avenge yourself, to make things right. I got this, God. I'll take care of this one. But choosing not to. How about your enemies? How about those that do you wrong? How about those that do you evil? Are you patient? Are you willing to let God handle it? Or are you going to step into it and take the reins? Patient. Kindness. This is the grace that pervades the whole nature Mellowing all that would have been harsh. I'm not even going to try and say it. I don't know why I put it up there. See, patience, you can do something, but you choose not to.
kindness is what you are. This is allowing God's grace to so inundate you that your very thoughts are kind toward others. This is the nature of what a Christian should be. This is the velvet glove. Okay? Because goodness is the iron fist underneath the velvet glove. You go, wait a minute, what, what's with the iron fist? You just told me I was supposed to be patient and kind. Yes. You're not to do these things for your good. And when God calls us to, we are to be firm, implacable, unmovable. There are certain things that we do not give an inch on. Was Jesus good? Is there any doubt? Was Jesus good? In that ministry that he had here on earth, was he good? And yet he braided a whip out of cords and went into the temple and cleansed it. That is what goodness is. Why was he cleansing the temple? Was it for his own sake? Well, kind of, because he's God. But he was holding as holy and righteous what they were profaning. They were making a mockery of what God had declared to be his. This is action. Scripture tells us that we are to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Kindness is the innocent as doves. Goodness is the shrewd as serpents. Okay? When people take advantage of us, and we know it, God has called us to forgive. He's called us to be patient. He has said that he will defend us. God is my defender. Okay? But when I see what God has declared to be righteous being profaned, I believe it is incumbent on me to stand up and say no. And we're seeing less and less of that in the church today. As culture drifts further and further away, we see more and more churches following culture. And we have the affirmation movement that says love is love and God is love. So any kind of love is acceptable. Therefore, if homosexuals come into the church, they're, ex they're accepted and they're embraced because they have love one for another. That's wrong. The people can be embraced. The sin is not. The sin is never embraced. Sin has to be confronted. When we have churches that stand up and say, I don't know why abortion is wrong. I believe at that point they cease being a church. They're a club. You don't know why abortion is wrong? Because God holds the power of life and death in his hands. Because God has said all life has value. He didn't say, I sent my son for just the good people, the healthy people, the people that don't have genetic disorders. He sent his son 
to die for anyone who would believe. God formed each and every one of us, knit us and fashioned us in the dark places, the deep places. He is instrumental. Without him, there would be no life. He creates each and every person. It's not an accident. There's no such thing as an accidental birth, an accidental pregnancy. I'm sorry, you can't accidentally do that. It doesn't work that way. And God is never caught off guard. <gasps> that wasn't supposed to happen. Goodness. That's the action. Goodness. Character energized. Faithfulness. It's the characteristic of a person who is reliable, sincere. Can people trust you? Not just to do what you say, but the, can they trust you to be there? Can they trust you to get their back? Not just to stand with them in opposition to someone, but sometimes to oppose them. Can they trust you to come to them when they are in error and to come to them in love to show you your error? Oh, wow, things got uncomfortable there, didn't they? See, being a part of the body of Christ includes being accountable one to another. Are you faithful? This is one of the most incredible churches I have ever been in. When there is a need in this church, it is met. You guys have incredibly generous hearts. It's, it's fantastic to see. But let's take it beyond that. When you see somebody that's actually engaging in a sin, knowingly or unknowingly, are you willing to go to them in love? And tell them, hey, this is not the life that God has called you to. This is not something that he is, is, is supposed to be exhibited in your life. This, see the list, the works of the flesh, it's right here. That's, that's not good. Oh, what business is it of yours? <clears throat> All your business. Oh, you know, come on, we're supposed to be loving and forgiving. They can't be forgiven if they don't repent. No, no, no. I'm not saying you're going to, oh, out of the church and, and out of God's body. No. Look, when you're in the body, you're in for good. All right? Whom God has taken in his hand, no one can shake loose. Not even yourself. You cannot shake yourself loose from God's hand. Now, you can get rid of all the blessings that he's going to give you. You can forego all the treasures in heaven. You can get in, Dennis, by your smoking skivvies, <laughs> having nothing to lay at the master's feet. But that is not the life that God has called you to. When I go through the fire, I want to come out pure and refined. Only the dross is burned off. I want to have something on the other side of that fire to offer him. Are you willing to schleben? That's a word that uh, the youth leaders came up with because judging sounds so harsh. Are you willing to schleben? Speaking the truth in love? Gentleness, and I put meekness there because the word literally translated is meekness. This is a condition of mind and heart which demonstrates gentleness, not in weakness, but in power. This is power restrained. Okay? Now, patience, you have the ability to avenge yourself, but you refrain from doing so. 
Meekness, you have power, but you control it. This can be to um, not do things or to do things. Are you willing to let others have their way at your expense? Or are you going to stand up for yourself and say, absolutely not? Are you willing to be as Christ was, silent before your accusers and let God defend you? You realize that each and every one of you has at your disposal the power and of authority and authority of God, right? His spirit lives inside of you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. You have got incredible power. I was listening to a podcast from Voice of the Martyrs. It was a lady from Iran. Um, she and her mom started a, a house church. She actually went on television in Iran to challenge a Christian pastor and, and to prove that his God was not as powerful as her God. And she was ready to kill herself on national television to prove her devotion to Allah. And the pastor challenged her. And he said, I want you to wait one week. Give God one week. One week. And in that week, she became a sister in Christ. And she realized that the one true God values her life instead of that demonic God, Allah, who wants to waste it, who wants to destroy it. She realized that Jehovah values life, male or female. He values life. Allah has no value for females. None. Zero. No rights in the Quran for women. None. They're given a slightly less value than a goat. And she realized that the Almighty God loved her. Equal to any one of us. And so she started, uh, she, very shortly after she was saved, her mother was saved. They started watching videotapes. And the, the pastor that was over them, she said, you know, we, we want to do more. And he said, well, you, I can't do more with you. You're going to have to do it on your own. Well, how does a woman alone in Iran, who without the protection of a father or a husband, anything can happen to you, and it's your fault, don't believe me? Go look at some of the Iranian executions recently. You'll find several where women were raped <clears throat> and they were executed for having sex with a man outside of marriage. It didn't matter that they were forced. It's your fault. And God has, through them, established a network of churches all throughout Iran. She's not weak. She is not weak. That's one of the things that she said that she finally understood when she came to Christ. She understood that she was not weak, that she had power, she had authority in Christ. But the proper use of that power and authority is meekness, not weakness. Disassociate those two in your mind. Meekness is power controlled. Weakness is having no power. Self-control. The determination to not only, not only not, yes, not only not do what you shouldn't, but also do what you should. And see, both of those are valuable. Both of those are necessary. Self-control. Yeah, I'm not going to dot your eye when you said that. We could leave it right there, and that shows self-control. Or we could take it further and say, instead, I'm going to pray for you. I'm 
I'm doing what I should and not doing what I shouldn't. Self-control is both. Self-control is God waiting until the storehouse is full before his wrath is poured out. Self-control is God extending his grace and his mercy to those who did not deserve it. When all we deserved was the wrath of God, he chose instead to offer us grace. To give us what we didn't deserve and mercy to not give us what we do deserve. See, all of these things are things that identify Christ. They're all attributes of His. The entire Godhead. All of these are attributes of the Godhead. And see, if, if His Spirit is living in us, if we have relinquished control of our life, make a point of that. You have to relinquish control of your life these things will start growing in you. And it's, it's amazing because you get to choose whether or not they do. You can say, no, no, I'm doing it the way I've always done it. I know it's going to stink. I know it's going to be ugly. I know things are going to be miserable. But you know what? This is what I'm used to. Or you can say, you know what? Father, you have said that I need to have patience in this. That I need to exhibit self-control. Father, help me to love them in this moment. Help me, Father, to do good in this moment. Help me to be gentle. Help me to be kind. What turns away wrath? Soft answer. A soft answer. A soft answer. A man of temper is called a fool in Proverbs, repeatedly. A fool. Someone who is morally deficient. If you've got a temper, make that a matter of prayer. Make that a matter of prayer. Before that thing pops off, <coughs> choose in that moment to walk according to God's Spirit. I know because I have a temper. I can go from doing great to doing not so great really quick. And going through this study, you know, I know it's simplistic. It may not work for you, but for me. Man, some people count to ten. I quote the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, all right. All right, God, help me in this moment. I'm giving it to you. Now, I'm not perfect at it by any means. I still sometimes pop off when God catches me, brings me back. I still struggle with things. It's not an easy thing to do. Look, anybody that tells you Christianity is easy is a liar. Okay? Because Christianity is dying to yourself over, 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 over again. Giving up willingly your rights to embrace what he has for you. Now, don't get me wrong. It is absolutely worth it. But it's not easy. Because you have to trust in him. You have to show blind faith in him because you can't see what he's doing. But it is worth it. Absolutely. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, for your kindness to us. Father, for your love. Father, that we can come into your presence. I thank you, Father, for the worship service this morning. Father, that it was just exhilarating to be in your presence. That there I can find joy. That knowing you, I have peace. 
God, that I can see how patient you are with me. And that, Father, I would learn to be patient with others. That my nature would be kind. That my actions would be good. Help me, Father, to be faithful, not only to you, but, Father, to my brothers and sisters. To be consistent in how I live my life. That the testimony of my life would just undergird the testimony of my mouth. God, that I would be gentle. That everything that I do, Father, would be prompted by your love for me. And how you treat me. Help me, Father, to have self-control. Help us to choose wisely what we will and won't do. Help us, Father, to do what we should and not do what we shouldn't. I ask your blessing, Father. Seal these things in our heart. Keep them afresh in our minds. Help us, Father, day by day to grow more and more fruit in our lives, Father, that as we draw near to you, as we are being sanctified in you, our lives would exhibit this fruit so much more. We thank you, Father, for these things. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.